in. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to thank you and everyone uh, listening to, for allowing us to participate and discuss what we consider to be uh, issues of, of uh, pretty good size relevance to solar development. Uh, I also wanted to uh, note that I have the privilege of being here with Randy again. He and I have, have done this dance before. Uh, earlier this year, we were on a panel at a renewable energy conference discussing these very same issues. And Randy is a great asset to have here because he provides a lot of perspective um, and a lot of experience. And that way, you all don't have to listen to a lawyer babble on about law the entire time. So um, I, as, a, as a first issue, we received one of the other participants that we had in that previous discussion I was talking about was Mark Leverton with the law firm of, of uh, Rash Chapman here in Austin. And while it was obviously intended for uh, humor purposes when we originally got it, I think it's incredibly appropriate that we have it here again today uh, because, uh, it, at least in the context of what we're discussing here, which is energy development, uh, we're, it seems to us that we're all sort of heading in the, in the same direction here, whether you be an oil and gas operator or a solar developer or a wind developer, uh, anyone who's utilizing surface or mineral interests, uh, and so it seems uh, reasonable that we should be able to all coexist. And so, um, you know, it, it, it seems to me that uh, it, before we get too far into this, we're going to talk about some basics uh, of, of the, the legal parameters that we're going to be dealing with. If you own a piece of property, uh, you know, for many years, the, the concept was this Blackstonian uh, uh, idea of property ownership, which is that if on the track that you own, you own that tract from the center of the earth to the top of the sky. And within your, uh, uh, the rights that you have uh, in, owners, in owning property is the ability to sever that land. And what happens is you have two parties can own separate parts of that land. In particular, one private party can own the mineral estate and another different private party can own the surface estate. This is referred to as the severed estate. You're gonna hear us talking a fair amount about severed estates today. Um, what issues a severed estate will raise in this context is that you have conflicts over basically potentially competing uses of the land. Uh, if a, a mineral interest owner is attempting to exploit the minerals underneath the land and a surface developer is attempting to do something on the surface, then you might have these conflicts that arise between each other. But it does seem to me that, um, well, let, let's take an example, for instance. If you have a wind development and you're doing it on a surface estate, and you're doing it over a severed mineral estate that's owned and perhaps even leased out to an oil and gas company at that point in time, uh, you're going to have some conflict, but as we all probably know, if you're putting together a wind project, you're talking about anywhere between 5,000 and 30,000 acres that are going to be leased up, and the equipment that's making up a wind project is going to be pretty sparse. It's going to be uh, widely distributed. So as a practical matter, this conflicting use is worked out on the ground usually, but we're going to see that it's different in solar. Um, and so, as an overall uh, context that we're going to be discussing today, uh, due to the importance of the energy development that can occur not only beneath the surface, but also on the surface, and in order to maximize land usage within the state, it seems to me that the answer to this question of can't we all just get along has to be yes. Um, so what sorts of conflicting uses are we really talking about? I mean, you can see here on this slide uh, that we've got uh, on the bottom right-hand part, uh, a, a, an oil and gas uh, well with related pipeline facilities that are using solar technology to be able to operate probably their meters, their communications devices, and, and, and any other types of, of, of items that are operating this well uh, that utilize electricity. And up in the top picture, besides cows, we have a a uh, pump jack that's being operated by uh, a group of solar panels there as well. And it makes sense that oil and gas would try to utilize this uh, technology to be able to power and assist them in exploiting minerals beneath the surface of the property because they are doing their development primarily in the same area that wind and solar are doing their developments, out uh, in the far reaches where there isn't a lot of electric electrical lines 
And when you do need electricity out there, it takes a while for you to work out with the transmission company to get it there. And so it, it seems to me that the question that's posed by looking at these, at, the, at these pictures is, you know, what's really the problem here? Well, this is the problem. If you're an oil and gas developer, and this is a piece of property, this is a picture, by the way, of the Weberville Solar Plant right outside of Austin. But if you are the oil and gas company, and this is what you have, this is a piece of land that you have the rights to develop, and this is what's going on on the surface, the first thing you're going to be concerned about is that we have a conflict here because I don't know where I'm going to put a drilling rig here. I don't know where I'm going to put a pump jack or a tank battery or my pipelines or even roadways to get all this equipment in here. And so my initial inclination is going to be I'm going to have to start fighting with somebody about this. On the flip side, if this is the type of development that you usually do as a solar developer, but you know that the land underneath this is leased out to a mineral interest owner, you're going to have a lot of concern about this. You're going, to, you're going to be uncertain as to where things are going to be able to go, and you may even abandon it altogether. And so the overriding theme that we're going to have today is this concept of certainty, that all the parties here are searching for certainty, and that based on the discussion that Randy and I are going to be giving you today, we think it's reasonable that certainty can be obtained for everybody involved, uh, and, and particularly not at the expense of somebody else not being able to do what they want to do with this piece of property. So with all that as practical uh, experience and practical knowledge and sort of as background, I'm going to dive into the legal conflict here uh, as the basis of the conversation that we're going to have today, and we're going to talk about the basics of the law that's applicable here. In Texas and in some other places, the basic law on a tract of land where you have a severed mineral estate is that the mineral estate is the dominant estate and it has the right to utilize as much of the surface as is reasonably necessary to exploit the minerals below. Now, what that ultimately means, as you might imagine, is that the mineral estate is going to be able to do what they need to do on the surface to be able to uh, uh, produce the minerals from below. The reason that this became the law many, many years ago is because without the ability to utilize the surface, the mineral estate is worthless. And so courts and, 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 and legislatures decided that the mineral estate has to be dominant, but that it cannot be an unfettered right. The mineral lessee or the mineral owner has to be able to or ha has to conduct itself in a manner with due regard to the existing and possibly future uses of the surface when it is conducting its operations out there. This was the law for a long time until basically 1971 when the Supreme Court of Texas heard a case that's called Getty Oil versus Jones. The background facts in this case are that Jones owned a piece of property and he was doing some farming operations on, that, on the surface of that property and he had a center pivot irrigation system. Uh, which ultimately means that he had an irrigation system that, that crawled around the ground in a circle, watering all of the crops so that he could obviously grow them and, and, and harvest them. The mineral estate that was attributable to that tract of land was owned by, was under lease, excuse me, by Getty Oil. Getty Oil had already put some wells and some pump jacks and other equipment on this piece of property and in the area but decided that they needed two more wells and a couple more pump jacks to support the operations of those wells, and they needed to put it on this property where Mr. Jones was farming. So without really contacting him or doing any sort of, 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 of damage control, if you will, they went out there and they put their two wells where they wanted to put them, and they put two pump jacks. The pump jacks were too tall for the center, period, center pivot irrigation to work. And so Jones brought them to court alleging that basically his farming operations were over if they couldn't get this um, pivot system to work, and the pivot system wasn't going to work with those pump jacks where they were. And Getty Oil's response ultimately was, we're the dominant mineral estate. We can do whatever we want to on the surface. The Supreme Court at that point announced what is known now as the accommodation doctrine. And the accommodation doctrine is ultimately where there is an existing use by a surface party that would be impaired or precluded by a mineral party's activities, and where there is an industry-established alternative practice that's reasonably available to the mineral party that would not impair or, or preclude the, the existing surface activity, 
the mineral party may be required to use the alternative practice. What that basically means is that if the oil and gas developer is capable of not putting it in that exact spot and still be able to exercise its rights to the mineral interests, then that's what they may be asked to do by a court. The, over time, the analysis that a court has to do in a case where the accommodation doctrine, and the, let me back up, the accommodation doctrine itself is a really fact-intensive uh, discussion. It, there isn't a bright line test for if you have XYZ on your property, the oil and gas company can't do anything, and if XYZ is not present, then the, X, then the, the oil and gas company has the right to do whatever they want. But over time, this, the, 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 the facts have become easier, if you will, for surface owners because of the development of technology in the oil and gas industry. In particular, back in 1971 when Getty versus Jones was, was made a determination, directional drilling, at least purposeful directional drilling, was unheard of. Uh, there were plenty of wells that meant to go straight down, but they didn't. But nobody said, I'm going to put my, my dr drilling location over here, and I'm going to drill to over there, and I know I can get there. And certainly, horizontal drilling at that point in time wasn't contemplated. And so the point is, is that as we move along with technology in the oil and gas industry, those industry established alternative practices become more and more reasonable for a surface owner to say, you don't have to put that right there because you can directionally drill. Now, a court will take into consideration the financial impacts and things like that. Uh, but overall, uh, that's, that's, that's sort of the status of where the accommodation doctrine is right now, and that's how it plays into what we're going to be talking about today. As you can see in that last part of the slide, Alaska, Arkansas, Colorado, New Mexico, North Dakota, Utah, and West Virginia also recognize either by court decision or by statute some form of the accommodation doctrine. The jury is still out about whether Pennsylvania recognizes it. There are lower court decisions that say that it does, but the Supreme Court has never said anything about it. And finally, you'll see there's reference here that other states have enacted specific surface damages statutes, uh, which in their most, you know, in their most simple form, basically state that if you own uh, a mineral lease, you have to contact the surface owner prior to doing any work out there, and you have to engage them and basically say, here is what I'd like to do as far as paying you surface damages payments for what I'm going to do out here. Uh, there's a whole litany of other things that can occur, but what I find interesting is that these states seem to try to say surface damages statutes are in lieu of the accommodation doctrine, and they don't really seem that way to me because it assumes that the oil and gas company is going to be able to put their items wherever they want to. This is really just a discussion about how much I have to pay you after I'm done. So with all of that uh, legal background and context, uh, I'm going to turn to Randy and, and ultimately going to ask him, what sort of nuances uh, are you aware of that a solar development will encounter as opposed to wind development? Uh, I've been involved in wind energy development for over a dozen years, and in that time I have not experienced conflicts with petroleum production. There are typically several hundred feet between turbines and a few thousand feet between turbine rows. I've built wind farms in the middle of oil fields with few problems. As long as there are reasonable setback agreements in place, there should be no infrastructure conflicts. Okay. And so then what is your experience from a, a solar developer's perspective regarding the interaction between these two estates that we just laid the background out for here? Well, solar development is much simpler than wind in many ways. Uh, we have a uniform resource. The facilities are easy to site and easy to build. However, a utility-grade solar energy facility can, can be a sole use of the land so solar developers in Texas should recognize the dominance of the mineral estate. And if we overlay the solar resource map on a depiction of oil and gas activity in Texas, we can see that this is uh, pretty much an unavoidable issue. The early solar projects I worked on were for an international investment bank. Their initial fatal flaw analysis concluded that they would not enter into a solar lease or finance a solar project until the mineral issues were resolved 
because of the uncertainty around potential litigation by the mineral estate. On the other hand, the economics of a solar project are so tight that there is little room for landowner leases and royalties, much less payments to mineral owners. So there's no incentive for the mineral owners to waive the uh, rights to the surface. This is what I call the solar conundrum, and, it, and that is why I had to throw myself at the feet of the UT Law School to help me figure this out. <laughs> well, it, it, based on that, what sort of options do you find uh, the solar developer realistically has to be able to deal with this type of issue, and, and what's your experience in attempting to negotiate or implement these types of agreements? Well, solar developers can consider purchasing the minerals, although on a large site, this is probably so expensive that it blows up the economics of your project. There are formula based on past rent and royalty payments to calculate the value of the mineral estate. However, in my experience, uh, the minerals are worth whatever you can negotiate with the mineral owner, and yet this does resolve the mineral issues and it may work on smaller tracks. Solar developers may seek a, a waiver of surface rights from mineral owners. I worked with a waiver drafted by one of the most expensive legal firms in Texas. The document was confusing and intimidating and no one ever signed it. It's been my experience that Texans will not waive their rights to anything. A document like uh, Appendix B in your paper is a more promising approach. You call it a hybrid between a waiver and an accommodation agreement. I negotiated this on behalf of a municipality with a top five petroleum company. Let's call them the giant. The document was written by the giant's legal team. So it is, it is simple, straightforward, it's familiar looking to mineral owners and it reinforces all the rights encoded in Texas law. The bank added indemnity and assignment language and whatever was required to make the document financeable. Essentially, this surface rights agreement designates drill sites, access areas for roads and pipelines and central tank batteries for storage of their product. The exhibits to the document uh, illustrate what directional and horizontal drilling patterns might look like. The feedback on this document indicates that this is a fair approach and that the negotiation is over the design of the drill sites. Even so, mineral owners are eternal optimists who are speculative and cautious they usually don't have the internal resources for geological analysis, which is very expensive. Often there are multiple mineral owners and thus many negotiations. So in some ways it is better if the minerals are leased. The operator can assess the geology and knows how to explore and where to drill. You have a single negotiation that's more practical and direct. It uh, is to the operator's benefit because if the drill sites are reserved, there is no horse race to see who acts first. Agreements with mineral lessees provide an assuring precedent for the mineral owner that his right to explore is preserved. Remember that these negotiations are on behalf of surface owners and must be conducted with their authorization. Your ultimate fallback position is to agree to a uh, drill site for each 40 acres, which is the maximum allowed by regulations in Texas. Finally, reserve the drill sites and access areas and integrate them into the design of your facility, regardless of whether all the mineral owners agree. Because as it says in your paper, such proactive measures would help support an accommodation argument later if the mineral parties attempt to locate mineral infrastructure where there are existing surface uses. I urge my colleagues in the solar energy industry not to overlook mineral issues. They can potentially have tremendous negative impacts on solar energy development. 
we have a new industry on the horizon. So at the outset, we need to be mindful of our reputation and hold ourselves to the highest standards. I, I couldn't agree more, Randy. I, I appreciate uh, the background on all of that and, and, and the laying out of options that um, you have experience in. And, and, and I'd like to add a little discussion about one more option, and that is, uh, which you'll see on your screens, is referred to as Railroad Commission Rule 76. For the uninitiated, the Railroad Commission is the governmental agency in Texas that regulates oil and gas production. And they have a set of what they refer to as statewide rules. And as the name implies, they are applicable statewide. The Railroad Commission has split up the state into different districts. And within different districts, there are different rules for different fields, depending on uh, the depth from the surface or you know, what type of rock is in them. And this rule that I'm referring to, statewide rule 76, obviously applies to uh, all counties uh, and all states that it's applicable there. But you'll see it's a more limited, it's a more limited option uh, than a, we would otherwise see in the, the options that Randy are discussing. First of all, sort of the background for Rule 76, it's the result of the enactment of Chapter 92 of the Texas Natural Resources Code. The original uh, enactment was intended to maximize the utilization of the surface uh, while providing the ability of the mineral owner to conduct its business below. Um, during the, this rule is about 20 years, or this the statute and rule was about 20 years old, uh, and about 25 years ago, Fort Worth was a city uh, that. Nobody was really overly concerned about having oil and gas drilling within the city limits. But then Mitchell uh, discovered the ability to fracture stimulate rock and be able to pull gas out of what are really tight formations, things that normal oil and gas operations wouldn't be able to recover. As a result, Fort Worth became an area uh, known just as much for the play underneath it, which is called the Barnett Shale, uh, as it is for its cattle and other uh, town uh, uh, aspects. The drilling became uh, widespread. Uh, the Railroad Commission couldn't keep up with regulating it, and uh, lots of people were making lots of money. But in the meantime, residential developers in the area were concerned about how they were going to continue to build subdivisions without building one and then an oil and gas company coming in later on and saying, well, I own the minerals here, so you're going to have to move that house or you're not going to be able to put something there. I'm going to put this here and there's nothing you can do about it. So the Railroad Commission came up with Rule 76, which in its most basic form provides authority to the surface owner of certain tracks to be able to apply for the creation of what's referred to as a qualified subdivision or also called the, a drill site designated site, a drill, drill site designation, excuse me. And these qualified subdivisions limit the possessory mineral interest owners on these tracks uh, to explore and produce the tracks associated minerals from specified operation sites. This is similar to the concept that Randy was just discussing about laying out in a, in a private agreement who's going to be able to be where. This is this is the sort of, of, of activity that someone might have to turn to in the event that they can't get what Randy is talking about. Um, so what is a qualified subdivision? Well, a, a qualified subdivision uh, is a tract of land that cannot be greater than 640 acres and is located in a county with a population of greater than 400,000 acres or counties with a population of 140,000 people, I said acres previously, it's people obviously, uh, of 140,000 people, so long as that county borders a county with a population of 400,000 or is located on a border, border island. So what you're talking about here are areas that are within or adjacent to uh, major cities in Texas, Fort Worth, Dallas, Austin, Houston, San Antonio, El Paso and the counties that surround those counties so long as they have a population of 140,000 people. The, 
the, the, the rule also specifies that within these qualified subdivisions, the surface owner has to designate operation sites for each 80 acres that makes up that 640 acre qualified subdivision. The operation site has to be two acres or greater. Uh, in my review of Rule 76 cases at the Railroad Commission, they've varied anywhere between two and six, depending on the evidence that's submitted, and we'll get to that in a minute. The qualified subdivision application also has to provide for road and pipeline easements and other related equipment that the oil and gas lessee or the mineral owner is going to need to be able to get the production out of that site. But it provides an opportunity for a surface owner to be able to say, here is where I am going to be doing my surface work, and here is where you are going to be doing your mineral work. And the only other qualification is that it has to be subdivided properly for either residential, commercial, or industrial use. Now, with this as a context, if you are interested uh, as a surface owner uh, in going forward and, and applying for one of these, basically what, we, what you have to do is fill out an application. That application requires the usual uh, administrative regulatory agency paperwork about ownership and, 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 and entities. Uh, it requires you to submit a plat, a certified plat that shows where the operation sites are going to be, where the pipelines and roads are going to be, and the other related equipment. Uh, and it requires for the, uh, uh, the, the landowner to basically submit a complete, uh, a complete application to the Railroad Commission. At that point, this can go one of two ways. The, well, let me back up first. After the application is filed, the Railroad Commission provides notice to the possessory interest holders, and after they receive notice, it is at this point that this can go one of two ways. First, the landowner will be contacted by the possessory mineral interest owner and say, we need to work something out. I don't want to have to go to a hearing before the Railroad Commission's legal examiners. Or the oil and gas lessee will file a response and present some evidence and the, hear the case will, will more than likely go to a hearing before a hearings examiner at the Railroad Commission. At that hearing, the parties will submit evidence not only as to ownership and as to the map, but also engineering specs about how the oil and gas company is going to be able to get the production out. There will be ge geological experts that are involved uh, and, and other relevant parties, all of which leads us to sort of hypothesize that it's probably going to work pretty well for an oil and gas developer not to want to have to go down this road, but that depends on what sort of resource they see there. The, this, after the hearing, the Railroad Commission will consider the adequacy of the number and locations of operation sites and road and pipeline easements, and then they can either deny it as not meeting the, the requirements of Rule 76, or they can grant it. And if the application is granted, the surface owner has to begin construction of roads or utilities and sell a lot within three years. Now keep in mind, as we talked about before, the, the impetus for this was residential development in Fort Worth. And so this requirement makes sense to that, uh, uh, to, in that context. But here, obviously, there's not going to be any lots being sold by a solar developer or, or a, a landfill or whoever is trying to obtain a qualified subdivision. The Railroad Commission has said that this selling a lot within three years doesn't really, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a make or break type of requirement. The, 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 the in, intent of all of this is that operations will continue, not that you get a qualified subdivision and then you sit on it. Uh, you have to move forward with it or they'll revoke the, the qualified subdivision designation. As I said, this rule has been around for about 20 years. and this, it hasn't been used very much for residential or commercial purposes, and in fact, only one case has ever been appealed to a district court or a court of appeals, and that case was Sweppy, you, you know Sweppy as Shell, uh, versus the Railroad Commission. In that case, 
a, 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 the surface owner wanted to develop a landfill that was going to cover 1,280 acres. And so they filed two separate uh, uh, applications with the Railroad Commission for Rule 76. One, for each, splitting it up into two meant that they would be able to qualify for uh, a qualified subdivision because it wouldn't be any greater than 640 acres. The Railroad Commission granted their request and Shell appealed, uh, making basic arguments about the fact that they weren't going to be able to extract the oil from the designated drill sites, but also arguing uh, uh, legal aspects of Rule 76. The Third Court of Appeals in Austin uh, held in favor of the Railroad Commission and made basic two important findings on this basis. The first is that they, being the surface owners, were, were entitled to a qualified subdivision for each 640 acres. The importance of this is that if you have a very, very large tract, so long as you properly subdivide it for the purposes that are named that we described earlier, and you split it into 640 acre sections, you can have as many of these as you want. Uh, this may not be uh, you know, that, that's going to obviously depend, be dependent upon from a solar developer's perspective as to how large of a utility scale project you're going to be putting together. But the point is that it's the, the rule implied to Shell that you could only have one 640-acre, excuse me, uh, uh, qualified subdivision for an entire area that you, hit, that you leased up. And the Court of Appeals here said, no, that's not the case. The second important aspect of this is that the court held that a landfill satisfies the definition of it being an industrial use. Uh, the, the definition they used is of or pertaining to industry, which is pretty obviously pretty broad and would certainly be able to include many aspects of development, including, it seems to me, solar development. Um, the, broad, the Railroad Commission has broad authority over this entire process. And so, you know, while there hasn't been, uh, this hasn't been used, at least to my knowledge, by a solar developer to this point. Uh, it does seem reasonable that this is a procedure that's available so long as you're in within the right locations that we talked about before, and so long as you're leaving a sufficient amount for an oil and gas developer to come in behind you. So with all of that as, as sort of a, a brief discussion about Rule 76, Randy, as, as a solar developer, is this process something that you or anyone else in the industry would have any interest in pursuing, or would you rely on it to the extent that you would get private negotiations out of it? What do you think? Uh, I think this approach would be very useful. It's a single negotiation that's objective and procedural. There are some predictable costs involved to both sides that might, might act as a disincentive and encourage direct negotiations of service rights agreements. You know that we worked with the Texas Renewable Energy Industry Association to introduce legislation to expand the rule to include solar energy. The rationale included the following bullet points. One, the execution of equitable surface rights agreements with owners of the mineral estate will be integral to establishing a utility-grade solar Two, financing of solar energy facilities is unlikely if the uncertainty of potential litigation from mineral owners is not relieved. Three, the economics of solar energy disallows rent or royalty payments to mineral owners, so there is little incentive for them to enter into surface rights agreements. Four, without recourse to an administrative judicial process, this impasse could severely limit the development of the solar resource. Finally, it is in keeping with the intent of the rule to expand its scope to include all counties and to include electric energy generation in the definition of industrial use. And I think that those are great points to make because we're not, two points in response to that ultimately. One, we're not talking only about solar development in this legislation that you're talking about because as was the impetus for the original Rule 76 and Chapter 92, this is about maximizing the surface usage for a purpose that I think everyone in Texas would agree on, which is we need more energy. 
Uh, and in addition to that, it provides, again, sort of the theme that we keep coming back here to, which it provides certainty um, to all developers, whether it be a natural gas plant or a nuclear plant or a coal plant, uh, heaven forbid, be able, along with renewable energy, to be able to utilize the surface in conjunction or in coexistence with uh, oil and gas developers. So I, I could see why uh, this would be attractive to, to solar and wind developers, but also I think any developers of major projects that are going to run into these types of, of, of conflicts with, with mineral, uh, mineral interest holders. To this point, we've discussed these issues that we're talking about within the jurisdiction of Texas. Uh, but if you're planning on developing solar anywhere west of the Mississippi, meaning Great Plains, Rocky Mountains, Desert Southwest, uh, which obviously is where uh, the vast majority of the solar resources exist, as we saw from Randy's uh, uh, map and on out west, uh, you're going to probably be running into the Bureau of Land Management. And I wanted to spend some time just briefly laying out uh, dealing with the Bureau of Land Management in this context. Uh, the BLM is a division of the Department of Interior, uh, which administers the lands that are owned by the United States government for uh, the, in the, within the public trust. Uh, they own surface estates and mineral estates to the tune of 261 million surface acres throughout the United States and 700 million mineral acres throughout the United States, 58 million of which are what they refer to as split estates. Split estates are similar to the severed estates that we talked about earlier uh, wherein in a split estate, the Bureau of Land Management administers the minerals and a private mineral owner, or excuse me, and a private owner owns the surface estate. As an aside, there is a lot of development that's going on on BLM lands at this point that are related to their surface estate. Th that, that's an incredibly interesting topic, but because we're talking about minerals and the interactions here today, I'm not going to talk about that uh, a whole lot. I'm going to focus mostly on this split estate issue and how to deal with that from a solar developer's perspective, assuming that this is not uh, uh, dis disregarded and not, not disallowed from doing that. Um, the split estate, as, as we mentioned, is, provides, is owned by the BLM, and BLM provides opportunities for oil and gas developers to come in and lease up these lands. It's not like a private lease like we would see here in Texas where an oil and gas company shows up to the mineral interest owner and says, I want to lease this land, let's enter into some negotiations and figure it out. What happens here is that the BLM posts notices that tracked X, Y, and Z in California and tracks A, B, and C in Nevada are available for public bid. There's a private auction that's conducted on a certain day periodically throughout the year where BLM offers people the opportunity to enter into a lease. The highest bid is then uh, given the opportunity to enter into an oil and gas lease with BLM. That oil and gas lease has a 10-year term or so long thereafter as oil and gas is being produced. And that 10-year term is important because in my experience, I have seen plenty of oil and gas operators who have won this bid process, entered into a lease, but never done anything out there. After this lease expires, it goes back into the public lands hopper and can be, provide, can be set out for auction again by the Bureau of Land Management. And this will become important when we start talking about the options in a, section, in a second here. So if you enter into a lease with BLM, they require that the mineral lessee engage the, sub, the surface owner in negotiations for the purpose of obtaining a surface use agreement. This is not like a surface use agreement like Randy was referring to before because this is basically something where they say, they being the mineral interest owner, say, here's where I'm going to put these things. I'm proposing to give you this much money. Do you have a problem with this? And if the mineral interest or if the surface interest owner doesn't agree, then they have to go through a process where they make complaints to the BLM, et cetera, et cetera. All that is required of the mineral interest owner though is that they enter into a good they make a good faith effort to obtain a surface use agreement so long as they enter into that agreement they can get a permit to start drilling from the blm unless the surface owner takes some sort of action within a specified period of time and so what this ultimately means is that you have this underlying 
it's a similar situation to what we were talking about with severed estates, but with the added the added uh, uh, conflict, if you will, of it being the BLM on the other side. So what real options do you have as a solar developer where you're on a split estate with BLM below? First, uh, I haven't put it on this list, but the first option you always have is if you know ahead of time where you're going to be developing and they've offered these leases up for bid, you can go in auction. You can go into the auction and try and bid for them. The problem with this, though, is that, as we mentioned, this is a 10-year term, and unless you as a solar developer are planning on getting into the oil and gas business as well, at, after 10 years, you're not going to have those rights anymore. And yeah, you'll probably have your development out on that site already, but the mineral estate is still a dominant estate, and you don't want to put yourself at risk, and your financing parties aren't going to want to put, you, put themselves at risk, that within 10 years, BLM won't decide, actually, we are going to lease this out, and you're going to have to deal with it. The second option you have is, as you can see on the list there, is to amend the resource management plan. A resource management plan is a plan that each, you know, the, the, the BLM is broken down into field offices. And so the Baker's field office has a different one than the Seattle office or whatever office there is in BLM. Each one of them has a regional, regional management plan. And the regional management plan guides the oil and gas operations and guides the policies of the BLM when doing uh, split estate leasing. It serves to protect the unique surface resources of the surface above the BLM lands, and in particular results in what they refer to as stipulations, uh, which can be anywhere from restricting access to certain areas, putting wells in certain spots, or having to conduct additional reviews because it's the site of uh, an endangered species or, or, or they're nearby. When you enter into an oil and gas lease with BLM, these stipulations are part of what you have to enter into. So if you're a solar developer and you want to spend the effort trying to amend this resource management plan, you can attempt to get the BLM office to add a stipulation for if, if solar development is over this lease, here is where you have to be, or that it will be open or closed to leasing during the period of time that the solar developer is out there. The problems with this, ultimately, is that it takes an incredibly long time to get these amendments done, usually. Uh, I have some experience with one in California that's been pending for two and a half years so far. And the problem is, is that in order to add stipulations and amend the regional management plan, there's a differing opinion of opinion, but BLM is of the opinion that they have to go through the NEPA process, the, 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 uh, uh, the NEPA process to be able to get approval uh, because these are public lands, and that means engaging a whole bunch of other uh, agencies and uh, interests that are involved here. So it takes a long time. The other option that BLM has, has stated uh, people can work with is the mineral conveyance, which is basically that you're going to purchase the mineral interest that BLM owns out here. This uh, procedure is guided by the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, uh, and is specified in Section 209 where it says that the BLM may convey mineral interests owned by the U.S. where the surface is in non-federal ownership if, one, there are no known mineral values in the land. Uh, in this procedure, if you wanted to follow this, you would have to show the BLM that you did a research geologic study, technological study, that shows that the value of the minerals is zero, and therefore they should sell you the land. You're going to have to negotiate a price out after that, but, but they're not going to be inclined to hold on to it if you can demonstrate to them with reasonable certainty uh, that there's nothing there. I, I hearken back to the discussion of Fort Worth we had a little bit ago, where 30 years ago everybody thought the minerals underneath Fort Worth were worthless also. And so this is a difficult process to engage in. Secondly, if the surface owner can show the reservation of mineral rights is interfering with or precluding appropriate non-mineral development of the land and that such development is a more beneficial use of the land, which is, in summary, you show them that what you're doing on the surface is worth more than the amount of royalties they're going to get underneath, uh, then they will consider talking to you about selling these properties. They may consider talking to you about this, but you still have to negotiate out a price, and that's a very long administrative process as well. 
uh, not as long, obviously, as amending a regional management plan, but there's still some, some discerning information in here. As Randy aptly pointed out before when he was talking about private options, the solar developer may not be planning on having to buy these minerals as part of their, their development plan. And the other aspect that's involved here is that the conveyance can only be to a surface owner of record. So if you are a solar developer that operates by leases, you're going to have to talk your landowner into going and, get, and doing this process with you as well. Uh, so BLM has options. We have approached BLM uh, by uh, regarding the type of surface agreements that Randy has talked about. Uh, but they're not interested because they hold this land in public trust, and they're concerned about what sorts of ramifications there are going to be to them waiving rights to utilize any part of the surface that they're entitled to. So that's an overall view of uh, what BLM does on these lands. Uh, I, I'm probably going to end it right there. I would say overall, uh, the discussion we just had provides a backdrop for the development conflicts and for issues for mineral lands that are underneath solar developments. But I think it's pretty clear that options do exist and others are likely to be developed as technologies develop over the future, just as they have over the last 15 or 20 years. And that coexistence is a reasonable uh, option and a reasonable goal for parties that are uh, on these severed or split estates. And uh, I, I, we're available for questions at this point if anybody has any. Okay, great. Uh, Greg, if you could advance to the next slide. Perfect, with our Coexist bumper sticker. Um, again, please post your questions in the chat window in the lower right corner. You can send them to all panelists or to all participants if you have a comment that you want the entire audience to see. And I will start off with a few that have come in. Um, so first of all, uh, Greg, the first question was, in reference to the uh, BLM's new Western Solar Zones program, there was a question if that deals with mineral rights in those designated solar zones in Western states or if that's something else. And I will chat the link to the background information. The, okay, great. Thanks, Rick. Um, the, the Western Zones designation is a surface use issue, those are applicable where BLM owns the surface or owns the property in fee, meaning they own the surface and the minerals. Um, so it doesn't have to do in, in, in particular with um, uh, uh, the mineral issues, split estate mineral issues that we're talking about here. But obviously in that context, uh, they, uh, as the BLM, are probably not going to be offering those minerals up for auction. Uh, because they've already committed themselves to utilizing the surface, or they're going to have some sort of a plan to be able to deal within those zones. So uh, I do think that the, that the issues that a solar developer would have to deal with as far as minerals are concerned are lessened by that. Randy, do you have any comments on that? Well, just in general about the BLM's process, I'm very envious that they have this resource management plan mechanism in place. You know, if we had something like that here in Texas, well, it make it a lot easier to resolve these issues. And that's really what I'm trying to do with the surface rights agreement, is, is come to an agreement with people about how to maximize resources on a particular site. OK, the uh, next question just came in from David. Besides surface and mineral rights, what other potential owner's rights should be of concern to the solar developer? Uh, what other potential uh, ownership rights uh, are are of concern to a solar developer? Well, I think that you know I, I think one thing that we're going to have to be concerned about, I suppose, you know, it, what, what you would see in a wind developer. Let me let me start off there. What you'd see in a wind development is that existing uses of the surface can continue generally because of the way that it's set out. Existing uses for a solar for, a, for, a, for a, a landowner that has a solar development on it are, are frankly going to be pretty much gone unless you're planning on farming low light crops that are going to grow underneath the panels. And so I think that understanding, as a solar developer, understanding uh, that what you are presenting to the landowner is basically a restriction on their ability to use the surface over the life of the lease is important to get through to them and if they, there are specific things that they want to continue to do with the surface that you as the developer need to know right up front. 
Well, I think in association with that, it's not really so much a right that you have to be concerned with, but a lot of solar facilities are going to be sited in municipal areas. Uh, and in some ways, that, uh, that helps you with the mineral issues because there are probably uh, restrictive zoning ordinances within municipalities that, uh, that uh, are already in place to deal with, uh, with drilling issues. So uh, that's one of the things that you have to check off your list if you're in a municipality, but uh, uh, it can actually be uh, an advantage to you uh, in dealing with mineral rights issues. All right, great. The next question, uh, probably for Randy, the uh, question was, how much solar power can you put on uh, 640 acres on a single qualified subdivision? Uh, that really kind of depends upon the technology that you use. Uh, we've got uh, fixed tilt panels, uh, single axis and double axis panels. They have different spacing requirements. Uh, some of it is going to depend upon what type of surface rights agreements you come to with mineral owners. Uh, the, one of the exhibits that I had there with the Giant, we, we had four uh, drill sites in the center of, of the quarter sections, the access areas and central tank batteries. There really wasn't a lot taken out of there, but uh, you know, this fallback position is something that I, I need to go into a little bit more. Uh, unless you want to reimburse the, the mineral estate uh, for limiting their access to the surface, uh, you may have to go to this uh, drill site for every uh, uh, 40 acres. Well, that's 16 sites per uh, square mile or per, per, per section. So uh, at two to six, acres a piece that could be a considerable chunk out of your out of your solar development so in general uh, i would say that perhaps 50 megawatts would fit on a on a square mile uh, but uh, you certainly need to take this into account as to how much would be taken out uh, by uh, mineral exploration and i think that the indication here for the solar developer is to go ahead and lease more than what, uh, what uh, it takes to put your solar development out there or, or buy more of the surface than, than just uh, what your solar panels are gonna take into account. And then, then you have the flexibility to come up and meet your power pur purchase obligations and uh, still avoid these legal conflicts with the mineral estate. The only, the only comment I would add to what Randy is talking about is he, he made reference to 40 acres and how much how much development you're going to be able to get on a section is going to be dependent upon the field rules that are implemented by the Railroad Commission that underlie that property. 40 acres is the statewide uh, rule for producing oil and how much ground uh, coverage an oil well can uh, drain, basically. And so they, the Railroad Commission has spaced wells out 40 acres from each other on a default uh, basis, on a statewide basis. But each one of these uh, uh, oil and gas, potential oil and gas uh, reservoirs that are underneath the land here can have separate and different field rules, which means that you could have one where it's 20 acres. You, there are specific rules as about for, for, a, for an oil and gas developer about how far away from the lease line they're allowed to be and how close they're allowed to be with other wells. And so I, I don't know the answer for whether that affects the 50 megawatts that Randy's talking about, but it's other aspects that a, that a solar developer has to be familiar with is what are the field rules out here and how am I gonna be able to present something reasonable to the oil and gas developer so that they're gonna be able to maximize their ability to exploit minerals with that, but, but not at the complete expense of my project. Okay, well those are good points, Greg. And uh, you know, I think part of this has to do with who acts first. That's what the accommodation agreement uh, a doctrine is about. So uh, if, you, if you make agreements on uh, a 40 acre drill spacing and you go ahead and build your facility based upon that and then they, they make a, an incredible mineral find and they want to go through the extra processes to, to have a 20 acre uh, drill spacing as you mentioned. Uh, I think that you're still covered because uh, they can still access all that through directional drilling 
and that's considered a, a, a legitimate alternative for the industry. Uh, take this into account when you're doing your prospecting. If you see intense uh, mineral exploration activity, no matter how good your resource is, no matter how good your, your uh, transmission access is, uh, you're probably just opening yourself up to a lot of headaches. You know, if you go out there, you don't see a lot of uh, oil and gas activity, well, that's, that's a, uh, a more likely and easier path uh, to success. Okay, and uh, there was a question on this slide eight and nine, um, probably for Randy. It was uh, the person wanted to know if you could walk through this example with some specifics about how this accommodation plan was reached between the solar developer and mineral rights owner. And I think it was, is this a, a real plan or a proposal? Uh, this was this is a real plan. It was uh, with the the, uh, the giant that uh, that I mentioned earlier. Now the advantage that the giant had is that they had uh, tremendous internal resources to assess the geology here, and they felt like that this was not a likely area of production. That uh, they didn't see any potential of working there for at least ten years in the future. Uh, but, you know, with the advances in drilling technology, they wanted to reserve a minimal uh, area so that they could come back at any point in the future. Uh, uh, we allowed them a little bit more room for their drill sites. Uh, it's hard to uh, arm wrestle with a giant, so they got pretty much what they wanted. Uh, the access areas on this were, uh, were 50 feet to accommodate roads. Uh, pipelines, distribution lines, whatever. They wouldn't necessarily have to be that wide. 30 to 50 feet is probably okay. Uh, the central tank battery, once again, it may have been a little bit oversized. Uh, as, as Greg said, uh, two to six acres is, is standard for uh, pretty much any kind of drilling operation. Uh, this, uh, this site was in the Trans-Pecos. Uh, it's also a windy area. The predominant wind direction is in, from the south. So I tried to work it out to where as much of the access would be from the north as was reasonably possible. And you see language like that in the, in the agreement. I don't know that it's going to make a lot of difference. You're still going to get a lot of dust on your uh, panels during uh, the, uh, the exploration phase. But uh, little things like shadows and dust are, uh, are uh, important in, in uh, solar uh, production. So uh, access from the north, if that's, uh, if that's feasible in areas where you have a predominant south wind direction, is, uh, it might help you a little bit. So uh, anyway, I mean, this, these are the components. And you may have to go to this uh, uh, two sites for every 80 acres. You may have to go to, to tighter uh, drill spacing, I was talking with a, a geologist about it, a young uh, 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 geological engineer, and he was visualizing all this from above, and he said, oh yeah, it's going to look like plaid when we get finished <laughs> with it. By the time we put all the roads in the uh, drill sites, you get the, the solar panels out there, the, the end result may look like plaid. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, that's actually all the time we have for today. So thank you very much for uh, presenting. And I've posted here both Randy and Greg's email addresses. If you have further questions, you can feel free to contact them. Or if you want to get started on trying Greg's proposal for the uh, qualified subdivision strategy, then please let us all know. And uh, Greg, Randy, did you have any closing remarks? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. That's all I have. Yeah, we've taken up all of our time, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with you.